Hello and welcome to the Place to Place podcast. I'm Claire Dewhurst, the director of City Nation Place, which is the forum for place brands and place marketing. The idea behind this podcast series is to create a chain of conversations between place branding leaders to give you the opportunity to listen in to honest conversations about their challenges, the solutions they're finding, and the opportunities they're exploring to ensure that their place brand strategies deliver real economic benefits. We're really thrilled that you've chosen to tune in and I hope you enjoy the discussions. Welcome to this episode of the Place to Place podcast. And I'm delighted to welcome back Monica Yule, who's the Chief Destination Marketing Officer with Westgrow, which is the marketing organization for the Western Cape of South Africa. Welcome back, Monica. And Monica has asked to chat with Adam Burke, the President and CEO for LA Tourism over there on the West Coast of America. Welcome, Adam. I know this is going to be a great conversation. I think you're going to talk about resident-centric tourism development, sustainability and everything that that means, travel for good. And of course, how places can leverage major events in a more inclusive way. But I guess the conversation could go in any direction. So over to you, Monica and Adam. Thank you very much. And uh, I guess I'm going to say good morning, Adam, even though it's afternoon here in the beautiful Cape Town. And thank you for joining me and allowing me to pick your brain in this Place to Place podcast. Very happy to have time with you. Thank you for getting up early enough to chat to me. So I've been doing a little bit of reading on LA Tourism and your Convention Bureau, and it struck me that you see as your mandate that you are responsible for the quality of life for your citizens, which is an interesting lens. At Westgrow, we talk about job creation and economic opportunities, but obviously you speak really more about the philosophy or the ethos behind the economic activity. So can you tell me a little bit more about this quality of life mandate? Absolutely. And, and I will say to you, good afternoon. And uh, thanks so much for making the time for a, a second appearance, Monica. I think the more that I hear the things that City Nation Place does, I think the more we realize there are so many commonalities around the globe and we have so much of an opportunity to learn from each other. So I, I will probably pick your brain right back. But in terms of quality of life, yeah, one of the things we talked about a couple of years ago, there have been any number of topics that historically have been somewhat off limits for destinations, things that were treated like the proverbial third rail. And a lot of destinations, I think, had the perspective that our role was simply to promote our destinations. And I think one of the founding principles was the notion that what is good for residents is always good for visitors, but the converse does not necessarily hold true. And that if we're gonna be effective as being good stewards of our destination, then we really have to become a resident centric organization. And that I think was really behind a shift, even in our mission statement. If you think about our historical mission statement, first of all, I'm a, I'm a big fan of Simon Sinek and his notion of start with why rather than what, and our previous mission statement was very much a what statement. It was, you know, something along the lines that I won't even try to remember the whole thing because it was quite lengthy, but it was. You know, promote Los Angeles as one of the world's premier destinations for conventions, meetings, and individual leisure travel with a focus on the segments of, et cetera, et cetera. As we started having more and more of these conversations, we realized, first of all, that's about us. That's not about our community. And it's very much of a what statement instead of a why statement. So where we opted to go with it instead was our mission is simply to improve the quality of life for all Angelinos through the economic and community benefits of tourism. There are so many things that tourism does, and you had alluded to some of the operation to creating tax revenues that reduce the tax burden on those who live in the destination to what it does for business sales and, and really lifting up and elevating so many parts of our community, particularly the small business community. But beyond that, it's for all Angelinos. So what that means is it's not just for those who are the direct beneficiaries of tourism, but a good example is what it does for every single household in LA. So because of the monies that are generated through the hotel tax in Los Angeles, the transient occupancy tax in 2019, pre pandemic, the hotel community contributed $320 million us to the city's general fund. In 2019, residents in Los Angeles County 
saved almost $900 on their annual tax bill because of the tax revenues generated through tourism. So part of that is making sure that the revenues we generate support all Angelinos, and that includes those who are struggling. And then the second part of that is not just the economic benefits, but really the community benefits. I think people don't necessarily in the, in the general public appreciate how many projects, how many major cultural institutions, sports attractions, restaurants, hotels are built because of the business model that is reliant on visitation. And those are benefits that we as community members have the, the privilege of enjoying that probably wouldn't happen if it wasn't for how many visitors come to Los Angeles. Very, very interesting stats you've got there, Adam. Ours pale in comparison to yours, of course. 51 million visitors annually. I don't, we can only dream of those numbers in this country. It's just because we're at such a big market. I think proportionately, you probably do every bit as well. <laughs> yeah, and you know, the thing is also obviously South Africa and certainly Cape Town and the Western Cape, one of our unique selling points is our scenic beauty and our wide open spaces. So it also bears debating whether we even would want visitors of that magnitude, because I don't know that we would then still be able to claim that space. Tourism has to be good for the place and its people as much as it is good for the visitor. And I think how much tourism impacts every single individual that lives in a place was very keenly felt over the last two years when there were travel bans and re movement restrictions and gathering size limitations. So I think now more than ever, I think there's a very strong and deep understanding of what tourism does for a community. I think Monica, you touch on a really important point, which is this notion of, is there such a thing as too much tourism? And I think part of being a good steward and you articulated this in, in your podcast was making sure you're very protective of that so that that natural beauty is there for generations to come. But I think this whole notion of sustainability mm. really needs to be a broader conversation. To me, I look at it through the lens of something like the UN's SDGs, because if you read the sustainable development goals, there are a lot of things there that have nothing to do with climate. And to me, the whole notion of sustainability as a destination includes a myriad of topics, everything from certainly reducing our carbon footprint maintaining the natural beauty and preserving those things that are part of our destinations. But it also goes to things like making sure that we have innovative mobility solutions so we can continue to reduce our carbon footprint, but also more readily move people around. And how do we create sustainable funding models that can withstand some of the major business disruptions like we've seen over the last couple of years, uh, things like workforce development. If we expect to have a sustainable industry, we have to think in terms of how can we really adjust the way we approach workforce development to the evolving demographics and needs of a younger generation. I think the things we all are challenging ourselves to do is really look at our own destinations and identifying those elements of sustainability that are going to be most critical to the long-term viability of tourism in our destinations. We here in the Western Cape also labor under the fact that we are a long haul destination. We are an end destination. So we have to make sure that our key source markets, which all sit in the Northern Hemisphere currently, really understand that, you know, it's worth coming all this way because of the impact that long haul travel has on carbon emissions and so forth. We want to make sure that they understand that when they come here, they're experiencing a product that's worth it. But also we talk about travel for good. You know, it does good to the community. It does good to conservation. Our conservation efforts were under huge amounts of pressure over the last two years when there was no tourism coming in. It's really, really critical that we continue to receive a critical amount of high value international visitors, because that's what allows us as a country to sustain these large pieces of land where we can house all these beautiful animals and have all this wonderful scenery. So travel for good is sort of the, the umbrella under which we speak about it. And there's a lot of far flung parts of our province where tourism is the only employer. So we want to make sure that we continue to keep those communities thriving and keep those communities respectful and alive in the new reimagination of tourism in a sustainable way. The biggest risk we've got at the moment, and you can see it in the Northern Hemisphere as well, is tourism is currently being not necessarily treated as an employer of choice. We need to make sure that we also sustainably building the tourism industry in the future by making sure that we become once again that cool industry that everybody wants to work in. I mean, 
My word, there, there are probably four topics you've just hit on in that, all of which are fabulous. I'll start in reverse order. So first of all, I could not agree with you more. I think you saw over the last couple of years, people who might have worked in the industry for a long time and were really struck by the volatility of it. One of the things we want to try and do is it, certainly from an LA tourism perspective, we're going to run as a leaner, more agile organization in the future. What we'd love is people who have greater agility and adaptability, who are able to wear multiple hats as needed. And so I won't go so far as to saying we want generalists, but certainly we want people who have, you know, a high degree of emotional intelligence and are able to readily shift based on what the business's needs are. So I think that's one thing that we're really focused on is how do we build a more shock resistant industry? I've heard some people articulate, I can't wait to get back to normal. I don't have any desire to go back anywhere because I think this creates a watershed moment. First, to take a step back and in a very clear eyed way say, Maybe the ways we did things pre-pandemic, the pandemic really shown a spotlight on why those are not going to be the most effective ways of appealing to the next generation of talent in our industry. And, and then the last thing I'll say is you talk about travel for good. And, and I love, love the way you articulated that. I'm a big believer in corporate social responsibility or CSR. I think we have the privilege of representing our destination. So giving back to our community, that, that's an obligation. And so what we've done is we've partnered with a number of local nonprofits. We actually just recently did a, a volunteer project where we actually closed the office down. And for that day, our team did a volunteer project at Midnight Mission who do phenomenal work supporting unhoused Angelinas. For that day, that was the work of LA Tourism. But beyond that, we're, we're seeing more and more now this interesting trend, and I love it, that so many both individual guests, but particularly group clients, oh. you know, meetings, conventions, when they come to a destination, they want to leave it better than they found it. So we have right now, almost half a dozen corporate social responsibility partners who are really addressing some of the most critical issues in LA. Not surprisingly in LA, like a lot of other major urban destinations, homelessness is a tragic situation that we have to address. Well, there's a superior court judge in LA named Craig Mitchell, and he saw some of the same homeless people coming before his bench time and time again. And so he decided, I can't change the system, but I can at least change who I see coming before me. And he's an avid runner. So he formed the Skid Row Running Club. And it started with very modest ambitions was to get donated running kit and equip those who are living in the Skid Row community unhoused give them a sense of dignity and self-respect and focus on health and wellness by outfitting them and training them to run. Well, from those very humble beginnings, it has grown to day where they have not only weekly runs a couple times a week with members of the Skid Row community, but out of town visitors and groups will do runs with the Skid Row Run Club. And now it has grown. There's a wonderful documentary that um, is both inspirational, but require having some tissue at hand called Skid Row Marathon. <laughs> Skid Row Marathon highlights how they have now grown where they fundraise and they send those experiencing homelessness to compete in marathons around the world. And through expanding people's worldview and showing them the possibility. I mean, these are people who felt hopeless and helpless and not only restoring that sense of health and wellness and dignity, but also agency. And the notion that if I can train for and successfully compete in a marathon in Cape Town, then I can change the trajectory of my life. And that's exactly what he's done. And, you know, the degree to which he's been able to l help lift our fellow Angelinos out of homelessness is just remarkable. And so your idea of, you know, traveling for good, living for good, I think that's a wonderful example of what we have the power to do as an industry. I'd just like to interrupt this chat for a minute. There's so much to take in and learn from the conversation that you might well welcome a quick break. We're currently planning and building the agenda for the flagship City Nation Place Global Conference. And if you're enjoying listening to the thought leaders in this specialized world of place brands and place marketing, then I'm confident you'll want to be there. We'll be in London over the 9th and 10th of November, and you can find out more at citynationplace.com. Our first confirmed speakers are from places as diverse as Barcelona, Costa Rica, Fiji, Tasmania, and Vancouver Island. So I hope to see you there. 
I have one last question for you because I think we are about to run out of time. First of all, I want to congratulate you on winning the 2028 Olympic bid. It's a little bit outside of what we were talking about now in terms of the community, but obviously a massive event like that is always wonderful for a place. I mean, I still have very fond memories of our 2010 FIFA World Cup soccer a tournament that we held here in the country. We were on a high for weeks after that as a nation, and it put us into the homes and hearts of so many international potential visitors. It was just such an impactful thing for us to have happen at that time. And so I wanted to really pick your brain a little bit and, and have you maybe tell us how does something like that even happen for a place like LA? And how do you think we could maybe get something like that for Cape Town and the Western Cape? Certainly. So the first thing I'm going to say is actually there is a remarkable connection between everything we've been talking about and these incredible global sporting events. I guess one thing I should start with is our perspective as a community. One of the things I love about Los Angeles, and it's my adoptive home of over 30 years now, I'm originally from Chicago, is LA is one of the most diverse communities on the planet. Angelinos hail from over 140 different countries, speak over 220 different languages, so it's one of the most diverse and inclusive places. But that said, if you look at the United States, we are still contending with 400 years of systemic institutionalized racism and discrimination. That's just a simple fact. And as a result, one of the things we have an obligation to do, particularly representing such a diverse community, is make sure that building a more equitable and inclusive community and travel industry is really at the foundation of everything we do. So when you talk about these major events like a World Cup, and we were just selected as a host city for 26 um, in Olympic games, the good news is there are actually incredible things that does to create a more equitable and inclusive community. A wonderful example is the LA 84 Olympic games. Los Angeles has hosted two Olympics at a profit. And all of those profits in 84 were devoted to this foundation, LA 84, that to this day is still supporting youth sports programs throughout Los Angeles County. So there is a, a real legacy to these mega sporting events that can really lift up the community. And I think that's a, an incredibly important point. It can't just be about what it does for the economy during the short window of two weeks of an Olympic games done right. What it does is it creates something like the LA 84 foundation, which for you know, almost four decades is creating this legacy of lifting up those who have not had the same opportunity. The second thing is it absolutely takes a village to both secure and then successfully host these type of events. And a wonderful partner of ours is the Los Angeles sports and entertainment commission. The commission is really who leads the bidding effort. But one of the things they've done is they are working with the Business Connect program. And what that does is for every major event, and we started this with Super Bowl this year for the National Football League. And of course, that's American football, not proper football. But for the NFL, Business Connect gave an opportunity for minority business enterprises to submit a proposal so that we could make sure that those businesses who don't always have the same opportunity to take advantage of tourism were the largest part of the supply chain around these major events like the Super Bowl. I had the privilege of sitting on the, uh, the scoring panel for that. And, you know, to see these small businesses who have never had the opportunity to participate in something of this scale, it was inspirational because you could see what a profound difference it was going to make, not just in terms of hiring new people during the event, but elevating it so more people, both locally and who were visiting the destination knew about their business. So we've actually partnered with the Sports and Entertainment Commission. And everyone who participated in the Business Connect program, whether they were ultimately selected to work on the event or not, we have offered one year of complimentary membership with Los Angeles Tourism. So that those minority-owned businesses really have the opportunity to tap into all of our resources and see how they can really be the beneficiaries of tourism in a very positive way. So, so I actually do think there's a very direct connection, but, but getting back to your original question, it, honestly, it is a whole community effort. I think, first of all, it does go that back to sustainability because when you host these major events, you have to do so responsibly. So even from the initial planning process, which by the way, can be as early as a decade out for events like world cup and, and Olympic and Paralympic games. 
And for smaller but still large events, typically you're looking at least a four to five year lead time for things like a Super Bowl. I think you have to start with the community again. You have to start with how can you approach this event in a way that the community embraces it and views that it's going to have a positive impact rather than a disruptive or negative impact. And, and certainly, you know, I think every destination struggles with this, but you want to make sure that the way you're planning to address issues of safety, accessibility, homelessness, that you're doing so in a very responsible way so that you're actually helping to address the problems rather than trying to shunt them aside. So, so right off the bat, I think you have to work with community leaders, business improvement districts, chambers of commerce, and all of our elected officials to make sure that everyone is aligned on our bid proposal, including how it's going to be a positive benefit for the community. The second part of then I think is it really does require alignment with every part of the both city, county, and state entities. Because when you look at all of the public services that have to be provided for events of this magnitude, you don't want to wait until you've successfully secured a bid to start having those conversations. Because candidly, it's too late. You want to make sure, again, going back to sustainability, how are you going to move people around your destination when you have an Olympic Games? How are you going to mitigate traffic so those who live and work in the community don't find that it's impossible to get around their own community during a major event? How can you ensure that those in the community have equitable access to the event so that it's not just something that visitors enjoy, but the local community can enjoy? All the way to issues of safety and security. You know, I think one of the things that some destinations do a better job of than others is you can create an experience that is both safe and incredibly welcoming at the same time. And sometimes I think those two are viewed as being in opposition to each other, but you know, it, it really is that depending on the event, you know, as much as a five to 10 year process. And so how we approach it from a tourism board perspective is first of all, we work on helping the Los Angeles sports and entertainment commission with a few things. The first of all is the hotel portion of it. How do we secure the room block necessary? to make sure we have both the inventory of hotel rooms, but also the diversity of product. When you have people coming for an Olympic games, you have to make sure that there are price points that make it accessible to everyone. Another great example is you've hosted the world cup. You know, that the fan fest needs to be done as a free community benefit. So how can you make sure that you provide those facilities and really make it an equitable event so that everyone who wants to enjoy it can. And then the second piece of it is really, how do we create awareness of the event? So that it's not just what it does for the community during that event, but be, so it really creates more awareness of our destination. Because what I've often said is if you're looking to drive value and drive monetary benefit simply during the time that event is in market, then it misses the mark. Really the goal should be to use it as a platform, not to drive economic impact simply during that one or two week period but to elevate awareness of the destination and its attributes so that it creates long-term return intent for both leisure travelers and for groups. And that's really how we view it. I mean, the Super Bowl is a great example. We just hosted the Super Bowl earlier this year. We were thrilled to see that our hometown Rams managed to write a Hollywood ending and actually take the championship. But that generated, we were, you know, we, we could not have scripted it any better, but we <laughs> ended up with almost half a billion dollars of economic impact from that event. That's phenomenal. But what I'm far more interested in is what new jobs did we create as a result of that through things like the Business Connect program? What did that do to create more connection from those businesses that are perhaps underrepresented in our industry who now have been plugged in and can use that as a long-term way to develop and lift up their communities for job creation and economic impact. And, you know, longer term, what did it do to shine a spotlight on Los Angeles? It's not just about cleaning up the city. So it looks really good for two weeks. It's about foundationally changing the city in ways that have long-term benefit. Absolutely. So well put, really so well put. Adam, I feel like we could speak for hours. And what's interesting to me as you're speaking, I don't know if you're consciously or unconsciously doing it, but you're interweaving two things that I've always believed are actually just two sides of the same coin, which is namely legacy and sustainability. The outcome is the same. If you do the one, then you will pretty much automatically achieve the other. So, you know, making sure that you're doing legacy projects that are contributing to a community and an economy 
by and large automatically means that they're going to be sustainable into the future. I just want to, from my side, thank you for your time and for the wonderful exchange that we've just had. It's been a real enrichment to my day and a lovely way to start a thought provoked weekend. So thank you very much from me. No, and, and, and I'll say the same. I'm, I'm a big believer in the adage that strangers are just friends you haven't met yet. So thank you, Monica, for paying it forward by you know, agreeing to host this podcast. And I will look forward to doing the same in a subsequent one. Thanks so much, Monica. Thank you, Adam. Once again, I've learned so much. I look forward to welcoming you back, Adam, for the next episode. I think we've already lined up the recording and I'm sure you're looking forward to chatting with Scott Beck, who is the president of Tourism Toronto in Canada. I think you want to chat to him about DE and I strategies, about reconciliation and allyship. But I'm sure, as is always the way, your conversation will probably move off into also many other unexpected and fascinating directions. So we look forward to welcoming you back, our listeners, for the next podcast episode in a month's time.